As I was looking for stories of people dying in the mountains, I stumbled upon some information about a Soviet tourist Route 30, which sucked me into a deep rabbit hole. Typically, accidents happen to tourists on Mount Everest in the Alps or on dangerous rocky trails. In this case, though, we have an ordinary Western Caucasus route that even a child could walk. Yet, what happened to the tourists of Group 93 in 1975 made this tourist trip the deadliest in the history of the Soviet Union. Point anywhere on our spinning globe. I bet you'll find many captivating stories there. This video is brought to you with support from MOVA, and their globes don't even need a nudge. They spin on their own. This first-of-its-kind technology operates through the magic of light and hidden magnets, with no batteries or pesky cords involved. In the MOVA collection, there are over 40 different designs, from various stylized world maps to planets, asteroids, or constellations, crafted using materials provided by NASA. Head over to movaglobes.com using the link in the description and get a 10% discount with the promo code ECHOES. And while you're doing that, let me tell you about a mystery that unfolded right here on the globe, on Route 30. The headlines of articles covering this tragedy screamed that moral norms and laws of friendship had been blatantly violated, and people's behavior in the extreme circumstances even became the subject matter for a few feature films. One of the members of that deadly trip summed up his actions in a concise phrase. Those who wanted to survive, survived. So, what are we supposed to do in the face of a deadly danger? Save those weaker than us? Or do everything to stay alive ourselves? As always, viewer discretion is advised. In early September of 1975, Group 93, made up of 53 people of different ages from Uzbekistan, Ukraine, and Central Russia, arrived at Rafubga Falls. There. They were supposed to go on a training trip before embarking on the most famous of the 350 tourist routes in the entire Soviet Union, Route 30. Its other names were Western Caucasus, or Through the Mountains to the Sea, since it began from the settlement of Guzaripal in Adigea, ran through the Caucasus Nature Reserve, and ended with the resort town of Dagumas. The route was 93 kilometers long. Its main feature was that on their way, the tourists passed a few different climate zones, they scaled up the glacier of Mount Fischt and reached the Black Sea, which lies in the subtropical zone. Even though walking the trail involved conquering snowy summits, ravines, mountain passes, canyons, and waterfalls, even children were able to tackle the route. Route 30 was frequented by huge groups, which posed a problem, a catastrophic shortage of instructors. These positions were filled by enthusiasts for whom tourism was not the main occupation. Group 93 was led by the students of Donetsk Agricultural Institute, Oleksii Tsofanov, and Olga Kobayova. It was the students' first season of working at the tourist route, and their lack of experience wouldn't take long to show. On the evening of September 9th, a celebratory dinner was held at a shelter called Tepliuk. The tourists sang songs to the accompaniment of a guitar around a campfire. They danced and reached for the alcohol they'd sneaked into the camp in their backpacks. A lot of the tourists were older than the instructors. That's why Oleksii and Olga didn't rebuke anyone and didn't insist on everybody going to bed. This was their first mistake since strict adherence to the regimen is a crucial part of the camping trip. The timing is developed with great precision. For example, to avoid passing difficult areas in the dark or not to experience bad weather in the middle of nowhere, away from the campsite. In the case of Route 30, on the following day, the instructors were supposed to cross the mountain pass with their tourists to avoid crossing paths with a possible hurricane. Yet due to the late lights out, on September 10th, the group woke up two hours later than planned. Those two hours would play a key role in this tragic story. Instructors Oleksii and Olga decided to continue leading the tourists, although not everyone was ready to go on the route after a wild night. Because of this, instead of sticking together, the group stretched into a long line along Mount Guzaripal. Since many people lagged behind, bit by bit, it was growing colder, and it started to drizzle. In short, the route already too challenging for the sleepy tourists became even more difficult. Suddenly, soft hail started falling from the sky. Grapple, or soft hail, consists of round, snow-like pellets that ricochet with an audible sound when they hit hard objects. I describe them in such detail so that you remember them, since grapple is a precursor to a blizzard. If you see it, you should immediately take shelter, not keep on walking. 
which was exactly what Group 93 did. A snowstorm soon caught the tourists and their instructors in the mountains. The snow covered the trail and visibility dropped to the minimum, around two meters. At the time, the group was at an altitude of about 1,600 meters above sea level. Any experienced instructor would have immediately told their tourists to go back and wait out the storm. However, students Oleksi and Olga were too inexperienced to take swift action in unforeseen circumstances. That's why they stopped and started nervously discussing the options of saving their group, either to continue pushing through the Fischt shelter or to go back to Tepliuk. Another mistake they made was arguing right in front of the tourists. The young instructors lost whatever bits of authority they still had and caused a panic. Then, a few men, who were a bit more physically fit than the rest, decided not to wait for Alexei and Olga to make up their minds and walked off by themselves toward a forest located a few hundred meters away to hide from the storm. The instructors eventually agreed to go back down. However, a part of the group had already decided to follow the new informal leaders into the forest since they seemed more trustworthy because they had great military and camping experience. Then, Olga Kovayova gathered the remaining tourists and led them to a shepherd's balagon, a tiny wooden hut in the mountains located higher along the trail. To be honest, I started seriously thinking, who would I stay with in a similar situation? I still don't have the answer. Who would you follow? The new leaders and Olga with their groups went in different directions, while the second guide, Alexei Safanov, was trying to gather the people who wandered off. Searching for them, he eventually ended in the woods with the breakaway group. Oleksii tried to redeem his authority and ordered the group to gather sticks for the fire. Then, he went off again to look for people lost in the blizzard. Through the noise of the hurricane, one could clearly hear the screams of women and men. They all were seemingly close, but unable to reach each other because of ravines, a stream, and the ruthless snow that gave the people almost no chance of moving freely. Safanov barely managed to gather a few men, helped them to cross the bridge, and led them to a clearing with dry spruces. There, he started a fire for them and went off to look for girls. Meanwhile, Olga Kovayova led her tourists to the shepherd's balagon. She succeeded despite being almost completely blinded by the small and sharp snow hail. The girl was exhausted. Luckily, Vitaly Ostritsov and Vladimir Kryny were in the hut at the time. They took it upon themselves to save the tourists. Since they had only one pair of boots between two of them, Vladimir helped the tourists who were nearby, and Ostrizov took his dog and set out to look for the people lost in the woods. In the blizzard, he found Svetlana and Mihailo, who were completely soaked and freezing. The shepherd helped them reach the trees to have at least some kind of shelter from the snowstorm and asked him to wait for him. He was going to find the big group of tourists Olga had told him about and then return to the pair. On his way, Vitaly stumbled upon people who'd followed the new leaders into the woods, but then changed their minds and returned to the trail. This way, Ostrisov found 22 tourists and led them to the Balagon. Then, the situation in all factions that once made up Group 93 became the same. When Ostrisov, Savinov, and Kovlyova used up all their energy on rescuing people, they asked the other group members, who'd already managed to get warm, to continue the search effort. Yet for some reason, they all started behaving in strange and selfish ways. Savinov managed to find the female tourists who'd been calling for help and led them to the fire. However, upon reaching the place where Safonov had left them in, he was horrified to see that they hadn't been tending the fire and it had died. Then Oleksii asked the men to go get some more timber, but they didn't want to. Angered by their indifference, Safonov asked again, this time forcefully. The tourists obeyed. Yet when the two men came back with the timber and the fire started burning again, they started acting even more insolently. Standing around the fire, they pushed the newcomers away from it to warm themselves instead. Meanwhile, the experienced male campers, who torn the group apart, also started a fire and began eating canned meat as if nothing was happening. In the swirling blizzard, they could hear the people who'd followed their new leaders, yet they didn't help the poor souls. Soon, the distant cries turned into mournful moans and then stopped altogether. The harsh rule of life, survival of the fittest, started operating in full swing. In Kovlyova's group, the men also started thinking only about themselves. Losing his last bits of strength, Ostrisov dragged two girls to the Balagon and asked the guys to help save another girl, Dina, from a snow trap. She'd gone unconscious and fallen into the ravine, yet no one volunteered to save her. 
Then Ostrisov rushed to the rescue again. Getting stuck in the snow, he carried her until he fell, unable to go on. The shepherd couldn't pick the girl back up again. Then he barely reached the Balagon to tell the others where to look for Dina and where to pick up the couple waiting for him in the woods. Yet again, nobody wanted to leave the warm house. Ostristov barely forced a few strong men outside and told them to stick to his tracks in the snow to find the victims. However, the men walked for a few hundred meters and decided to go back. They told Ostristov they hadn't found anyone, yet indifference was displayed not only by those caught in the snowstorm. On September 11th, the next group of enthusiastic and fresh tourists, Group 94, arrived at the next Balagon. The group's instructors saw the frostbitten tourists of Group 93, but didn't offer any help or send any of their own tourists to the base to report the incident. Instead, they just headed for the Armyansky Mountain Pass, upon finding out that the Feast Pass had been blocked by the snow. Still, not everyone was this indifferent. One student instructor named Galina Kuzminkina stayed. She joined Shepherd Vladimir Kryny, and they went to look for other victims at night together. With the joint efforts, they rescued a few more tourists. Only on September 13th did the real rescue operation start. It shed light upon the inhumane behavior of some of the group's tourists. No one knows exactly who informed the rescuers about the tragedy. At any rate, it was already too late. The survivors were brought to the nearest camps, but the most important task was to find around 20 poor people who'd been abandoned in the snow. A helicopter was combing the terrain, but no one was giving any signals. Suddenly, the rescuers saw a girl running in the snow and waving her arms. It was Svetlana. As it turned out, she and Mihailo were sitting together under the spruce, where the shepherd had left them, but the promised help never arrived. The men Ostrizov had sent didn't even reach the spruce. They lied about not having found the lost tourists to return to the Balagon and get warm as fast as possible. Meanwhile, Mihailo set out to look for his abandoned backpack, as it contained many things that would help him and Svetlana stay alive, while they waited for the rescuers, warm clothes, food, and dry matches. Yet when Mihailo walked off from the spruce, he got lost and his body was the last one to be found on the ninth day after the tragedy. As it turned out, Mihailo had fallen into a deep canyon and was lying on the rocky floor of the Armianka River under an avalanche. Svetlana had no idea why he hadn't returned, but realized that now her survival depended only on her. The girl decided to stay by the spruce. There, she built herself a hut from branches and ferns. She also made a path in the deep snow and constantly walked, trying to keep herself from freezing to death. When Svetlana heard the helicopter, she tried screaming with all her might to be heard, but her voice had lost all its power in the frost. She thought this was the end, and then she saw rescuers rushing toward her. At that moment, the girl went unconscious, exhausted from holding out for so long. She was wrapped in a tent and taken to the helicopter. Out of all the tourists the rescuers found, Svetlana was the only survivor. What about Dina, left to lie in the ravine? Exhausted, she was begging the other tourists not to abandon her since her young kids were waiting for her at home. Tourist Mihail Rishkin, Valery Sokolov, and Vladimir Tritjakov promised to return to get the girl later. Yet after reaching the shepherd's hut, no one wanted to leave it again. Maybe they were also too exhausted. To be honest, all of the articles I found on this topic were adamantly critical toward those who survived and didn't help the others. The only reason why I managed to retrace this story is because I studied the comments of the tragedy survivors. Yet interestingly enough, most articles and interviews didn't specify who exactly had opened up about the experience. All because some tourists were accusing the rest and others were trying to whitewash their own fault. However, we all know that under extreme circumstances, a person can act differently from their usual behavior, especially when the survival instinct takes over. Although some people judge the tourists who didn't help the weaker people, they could only make moral judgments. The law, however, states that you are obligated to save someone else only under the condition that there's no danger to your own life. So, for the death of 21 people, Charges were pressed only against the officials and tourist center leaders. The investigation identified the leading causes of the tragedy as weak preparation of the route, poor tourist outfitting, alcohol use before the trip, failure to stick to the timing, and the young instructor's inability to act under unforeseen circumstances. The area near the Tepliuk shelter was closed immediately after the tragedy. It's noteworthy, though, that it wasn't Oleksii's and Olga's fault that the route's organizers hadn't hired professionals to guide the tourists. 
Despite their limited experience, the students did everything possible to save their people. There were no casualties among those who didn't stray from the group and stayed with the instructors. So, if you answered, follow the instructors, to my question, congratulations, you'd stay alive. Yet the irony is, if you were to push everyone else away from the fire and eat canned food by yourself, you'd survive in the second group too. So, write in the comments, would you risk your life and help others if you were caught in a deadly blizzard? Please, be honest. Subscribe to my channel. There are a lot of stories about people facing this difficult choice.